So this is a tour which accompanies the book that I brought out a couple of months ago called Musical Truth. And it makes a change to be doing a talk anywhere south of Birmingham because all the other talks I've done in the UK have been up north. And for some reason, I struggle to find truth, conspiracy, consciousness type, type groups anywhere in the south. They seem to be pretty few and far between. So I've got a few theories as to what the reason might be for that, but uh, it does make a change to be in this part of the world. What I want to do this evening is present a few excerpts from the book. I can't possibly go into all of it because if we did, I'd be here till about three o'clock in the morning because the book has 20 chapters in it. It's about 170,000 words and it's five years worth of research which took 13 months to write. So there's a fair amount of information in there. And all that I can hope to do this evening is just present you with a few highlights and hopefully bring it all together with some overriding themes and show how some of the main elements of the book all fit together. But the first part of the presentation is presenting you with a few interesting little tidbits of information which are included in the book, uh, which will hopefully be of interest. And then the second part is bringing it all together by way of looking at some overriding themes and concepts. And we get a little bit metaphysical and spiritual in that part. We're bringing in concepts such as free will consciousness, consent and natural law. And hopefully it will all fit together and make sense as we go on. But first off, the last few talks that I've done, I've started off with some stuff about prints because it's kind of topical. It's just over a month since we got the news of Prince's demise. And um, people have found it interesting to look into some of the strange, unexplained aspects of the official version of his death, which we got from the mainstream media. There's a few things to get into there. You'll notice that a lot of my slides are kind of drenched in purple. And I try and justify that by saying I'm talking about Prince and, and that's why I've done it. Uh, it's not the real reason, but it usually works. So when it comes to the official version of events that we got regarding Prince, as ever with the demise of any popular music artist, there are three possibilities as to what may have really gone on. So the first possibility is that everything happened exactly the way the mainstream media told us it did. And that'd be a bit of a first, wouldn't it? So that would be that Prince just happened to die at the age of 57 of the flu in a lift, you know, like you do. So then option number two is that he didn't actually die at all and that in some way his reported death was a hoax and the persona of Prince has been retired but the real flesh and blood individual has gone off somewhere covertly to live out his remaining years out of the glare of the spotlight. We get this often when popular artists pass away. There were a lot of rumours about Elvis Presley when the news broke about him in 1977. A lot of people weren't having it that he'd really died and they were of the view that somehow he'd gone off to live out his remaining years somewhere. And we had the same thing with David Bowie earlier this year. Those same rumours came about. So that's option number two. Then option number three is that Prince was actually done away with and he was got rid of by the forces that control the corporate entertainment industry and that for some reason he'd become a thorn in the side or a pain in the arse or he'd outlive his usefulness and for whatever reason he had to be got rid of. So these are always the three possibilities I find in such cases and my money in this particular instance is on number three which is that the forces that control these industries got rid of him uh, because he'd outlived his usefulness or he'd become a liability in some way. So we can look at some of the possible motives for why that might have taken place as we go on. But the official version, as far as I'm concerned, makes no sense and is a crock of crap from start to finish, as they generally are. Because we get the news, first of all, that Prince died in a lift, as I say, at the age of 57 of the flu. Then a few days later, that had changed into, oh, well, actually, he was on pharmaceutical medications, similar to Michael Jackson. So that might be what killed him. And then a couple of days after that, this has morphed into, oh, Prince secretly had AIDS for 20 years. Yeah, he kept it secret, nobody knew about it, but it finally caught up with him and that's probably what killed him. So, you know, none of this makes sense. There's discrepancies and anomalies and contradictions everywhere you look. 
and you've got to wonder whether this stuff is put out there to deliberately confuse and confound truth seekers that are trying to get to the bottom of these issues. But I've done a lot of research into the true nature of the corporate music industry and I'm talking about the very upper levels of it where all the household names reside, all the celebrities, all the A-listers that everyone knows and everyone has heard of. When you get to that level of the game, which is worth millions or billions of dollars in terms of the income that these artists generate, you find that uh, some very dark stuff goes on and some stuff that is hidden from view and that we don't normally get to hear about uh, is occurring. So I detail this uh, in my book and go into some of the ways in which that plays out. As I say, we can only get into certain aspects of that this evening. But just a few interesting little sort of anomalies and tidbits of information about Prince before we get into some possible motives. There's symbolism everywhere when you look at his career. And I'm sure you'll be aware that he was very closely associated with the colour purple. And this is Prince's Paisley Park complex just outside Minnesota. This housed his recording studio and his corporate HQ. And the story is that whenever Prince was present on the premises, it would glow purple to indicate that he was there. And you'll notice that on this part of the building here, it's a bit dark on the image, but you can see a pyramid with an illuminated capstone, which is an interesting piece of symbology to get into when we get into some of the favoured signs and symbols of those that control these industries. Round about the time that we got the news of Prince's death, you might recall that it coincided with the 90th birthday celebrations of the Queen of Germany, sorry, England, F Freudian slip. <laughs> and uh, we had a whole bunch of monuments around the world that were lit up in purple, we're told, to mark the occasion. And this included Niagara Falls on the US-Canada border, there was the Empire State Building, and there was a bunch of other monuments that were all lit up in purple. And the official story is that this was to mark the 90th birthday of her travesty, sorry, Majesty. And uh, it just happened to coincide with the news of Prince dying, who was an artist that was always associated with the colour purple. So you've got to ask yourself whether this is just a straight coincidence that an artist called Prince happens to die on the 90th birthday of the Queen and that colour, uh, purple, the colour that was associated with him, is chosen as the colour to mark this wonderful occasion of the Queen's 90th birthday, or whether there could be more going on. Because it strikes me that the odds of this happening by random chance or coincidence are probably several hundred thousand, if not millions, to one. Somebody informed me the other week that there is a pub chain in the UK called Green King, which is... Uh, seemingly the largest pub chain in the country. And in the days before the Queen's 90th birthday, they introduced a new brand of beer known as Purple Rain. And this was R-E-I-G-N. This, of course, ties into Purple Rain, the movie, the album, and the song, which were very closely associated with the work of Prince. And this beer brand, Purple Rain, came with beer pumps that were decked out in purple, and beer mats and towels and posters and stuff that were all in purple. So uh, it strikes me that there was a fair bit of pre-planning that went on there, which again seemed to strangely coincide with the death of Prince. There's also some interesting stuff about the date, the 21st of April, because the period starting around about the 19th, 20th of April and running all the way through to the 1st of May has long been known since the ancient world as a period of sacrifice, and usually sacrifice by fire, and it ties in with the period known as Beltane, which was very popular with various pagan religions and various occult secret societies through the ages. And so that whole period running up to the 1st of May has often been associated with uh, death by sacrifice. And there's a whole bunch of world events that have occurred around those dates over the years, including the Waco, Texas massacre, the Oklahoma City bombing, and the Columbine High School shooting. They all occurred around about the 19th 20th of April over the years. So straight away that date becomes very interesting to anyone trying to get to the bottom of all this symbology. This guy is L.A. Reed, part of the L.A. Reed and Babyface production duo and they put out a whole load of uh, swing beat soul records uh, in the late 80s, early 90s with the likes of Bobby Brown, Karen White and such. This guy in more recent years I believe has been 
a judge on one of these god awful um, talent shows on TV apparently. I don't know which one it is, I don't particularly care, but that's what he's doing now. So he's obviously a key player within the industry and kind of owned by these corporations and kind of ushered into place wherever he's needed. But anyway, he came out a couple of days after we got the news of Prince relating an anecdote uh, of a time when he was corresponding with Prince a few years back. And Prince allegedly said to L.A. Reid, do you know what the elevator represents? And he says, no, what is it? And Prince is supposed to have said to him, it's the devil. It symbolises the devil. So the elevator becomes interesting when you factor in Prince's song, Let's Go Crazy, one of his most famous. It's got lyric in it where he says, we ain't going to let the elevator uh, bring us down. Let's go crazy. Punch a higher floor. Talking about the elevator in that song, and then we get the news that he just happens to have been found dead in an elevator. So that's kind of interesting, given that Prince allegedly said that it symbolised the devil. Also, when you get into the etymology of the word elevator, as somebody pointed out to me in an email the other day, uh, you can break it down, and the first syllable is L, E L, which in Hebrew means God. And then we get into words like Elohim and such. And then the second part of the word Veda is also similar to Veda, as in Darth Vader, as in Father, and other kind of um, implications there. So it's an interesting word to break down in terms of what it may symbolise. And it seems to be very closely associated with what happened to Prince. So uh, you're probably aware that round about the mid-90s, Prince requested to be known by way of this symbol. And he kind of renounced his artist name. There was a period where he was known as the artist formerly known as Prince, but there was also a period where he wished to be known by way of this unpronounceable symbol. I did a podcast the other week with an American researcher by the name of Freeman, who gets into symbolism a lot and occult symbology. And I asked him what his interpretation was of this symbol. And he said it's basically uh, hermaphroditic and androgynous, representing a bringing together of the masculine and feminine elements in nature. So you see both male and female elements at play in the symbol. And there's also elements of the Egyptian Ankh, the symbol of life, going on there. So a very interesting symbol for him to have chosen. And when it comes down to why Prince chose to be known that way, we're starting to get into some possible motives as to why those that control the industry might have decided he'd outlived his usefulness and he was no longer required. So this was all tied into a long-standing legal battle which Prince entered into with his record company, Warner Brothers. And straight away here, I'm reminded of the legal wrangles that Michael Jackson had with the Sony Corporation going through the 90s into the 2000s. Michael Jackson famously referred to the Sony Corporation as evil, and he referred to the Sony CEO, Tommy Mottola, as the devil. He was calling a spade a spade, you know, wasn't mincing his words. And there's a lot of parallels between Prince and Michael Jackson when you get down to it. So they were both born in 1958. They both came from uh, abusive households, reportedly, and uh, had a lot of trauma and turmoil in their childhood. They both became massive superstars in the 80s and they were pretty much pitted against each other. It was very much Prince versus Michael Jackson in that decade. And they both got into long-standing legal battles with their record companies. Also, towards the end of their careers, both of these artists started making tracks which were kind of reflective, kind of spiritual, certainly meaningful in some of the lyrics. Most of Prince's work that he'll be remembered for, certainly two-thirds of his output, was basically about sex. It was kinky, freaky, you know, tracks. But for every track that he made of that nature, there was always a more redemptive, reflective one on each album. And as he matured in years, as is supposed to happen, as, as somebody gets into middle age, he started to get more meaningful and more conscious with the sort of stuff he was putting into his music, and the sort of stuff he was talking about in interviews. And we saw the same thing with Michael Jackson. Towards his, you know, the, end, the end of his days, he started making tracks which were a lot more meaningful and conscious than stuff that had gone before. So I'm noticing these parallels everywhere. And Prince's uh, dispute with Warner Brothers was all about the nature of the publishing deal that he had. And he highlighted the nature of the deal that artists have with their corporations generally, which is an exploitative one 
where uh, the corporation retains the lion's share of the publishing rights and the income, and the artist is just left with scraps from the table. It's a familiar story that we often hear about in the industry. So in statement about this, and in protest about it, for a period, Prince took to appearing in public and on stage shows with the word slave written across his face. So it's a very public statement about Warner Brothers. There was also uh, legal wranglings about the rights to Prince's master tapes of his back catalogue of albums. And after many, many years of battling in court with Warner Brothers over the ownership, Prince actually managed to get this back just a short while before he died. And this back catalogue and the master tapes would have been worth millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. Uh, and he just happened to die a short while after that. But I'm sure it's just a coincidence and nothing to worry about. There could be other possible motives for taking Prince out of the picture. As I mentioned, towards his latter days, he started to get quite outspoken. And he displayed all the characteristics of an individual that had kind of woken up to great truths about what goes on in the world and about the nature of reality. And he was starting to articulate a lot of that in his interviews. There's a lot of quotes and comments that have been attributed to Prince in recent weeks. And it's not always possible to pinpoint the exact interview where he's supposed to have said these things. So a lot of memes came online, such as this one, and it's not always possible to substantiate them. But if this is a genuine comment that he made, the genocidal Jews that I've encountered in the music business are the reason that I never played Israel, then you can understand why that might have pissed off one or two people uh, in the upper echelons of the industry. Well, it, absolutely, indeed. There are other comments which we can know for sure that Prince did make because the evidence is there, such as this video, which you can get on YouTube, of an interview that he did on a chat show in 2009 with a host called Tavis Smiley. And during this chat, Prince, pretty much out of nowhere, spontaneously starts mentioning chemtrails. And he's talking about the work of Dick Gregory, who's a long-standing US comedian turned activist. And Dick Gregory's in his 90s now, but he's still around. He's still doing his thing, and he's still commenting uh, socially on stuff that's going on. And Prince evidently started paying attention to stuff that Dick Gregory was saying. And he says that his information turned him on to looking into chemtrails. And Prince starts talking about how you can see all this crap being sprayed in the skies if you bother to look up, and how when all this nanoparticle technology and all these chemical components fall to earth, it's starting to make people ill and making people act crazy. So this is the sort of stuff that you're not really supposed to talk about on chat shows when you're a celebrity. It's pretty much off script. And if you start talking about this stuff, you're going to raise the attention of you know, certain parties who perhaps might have preferred that you didn't say it. So this has been cited as another possible uh, reason for taking Prince out. Just getting ahead there. And with a lot of people that I've spoken to about this theory, about the fact that in the mid-90s Prince went up against Warner Brothers and they would not have been happy with the nature of the outcome and... Uh, you know, they wouldn't have been happy with the fact that he took them on in the first place. People have said, well, you know, this was years ago. Why would they not have taken him out then? Why would they wait until now? Well, one thing which I've come to discover about the true nature of the entertainment industry and so much else, because it feeds up into the bigger picture of what's really going on in this world and so many other aspects of it, is that those individuals and those networks and groups that are controlling and directing all these things display incredible levels of patience and they very much play the long game and sometimes they plan their tactics years or even decades in advance so to me it's perfectly feasible that if Prince got up the nose of certain parties 20 years ago they could well have borne a grudge for 20 years and sat on it and decided when the time was right for them to you know, bring it to closure. And so when we have the Queen's 90th birthday and all this symbology that ties in and all the links to the colour purple, it could well be that that was deemed the perfect opportunity to finally take out this individual that had been causing so many problems for those that run the industries. You come to realise that 
the controllers uh, are absolutely steeped in dark ritualistic activity and they adhere to a religious belief system which goes back a very long way into the ancient world and is very much connected with the dark influence of Saturn. The planet Saturn is key to a lot of it and we see this in much of the symbolism that's displayed. We'll see some of it as we go on. So that's just some interesting little bits and pieces about prints which introduce us to the true nature of the upper levels of the corporate industry, what they really represent and the nature of the deal that artists have with these corporations. So if you play the game and if you stick to the agenda and stick to the script and do what's required of you, you can have a very long career, you can be very wealthy and you can achieve fame and fortune. But if you decide to exercise some conscience and some humanity and if you decide to try and go your own way, unfortunately it appears that there's a heavy price to pay. And we've seen many examples of this through music history. You know, why is it that John Lennon and Bob Marley and Jimi Hendrix and to a certain extent Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, uh, Peter Tosh, Phil Oakes and so many other artists that have met early deaths just happen to be the ones that have put out messages that are conscious, meaningful, unifying, uplifting, you know, politically relevant and commenting on social situations. Whereas the ones that just put out straight garbage tend to stick around for quite a long time. Um, well, what's your opinion on uh, the comments that he made um, in Amsterdam on stage regarding Osama and 9-11? Yeah, uh, like a of years you, you, you trekked. Yeah, this was December, was December 98. Yeah, exactly. So he, he's, doing a state, he's doing a stage show in the Netherlands. I think it's 23rd of December 98. Yeah. And at the end of the concert, he goes into this spontaneous kind of jam session. And he starts saying, I've got to go home, y'all. I've got to get back to America. Got to get ready. Osama bin Laden getting ready to bomb. Osama bin Laden getting ready to bomb. And a lot of people have kind of written that off by saying, well, in 98, Osama bin Laden had already had the Oklahoma City bombing pinned on him. And so he was already, he was already public enemy number one, so he could have been referencing that. But then, at the end of this section, he says, 2001, hit me. So where would that come from? And again, yeah. 2001, hit me, you can get it on YouTube. And you know, you, you, you have plausible deniability until he says 2001. Yeah. Now, the odds of that being a coincidence, again, I keep going back to odds, but it's important, are millions upon millions to one. Because you get a lot of sceptics with all this stuff. I get them all the time. And they say, oh, this stuff just happens. You're reading too much into it. But really, what are the mathematical odds of this just happening organically by chance? It is millions to one. So this hints at some kind of foreknowledge on the part of Prince as to what was going to happen just, what, two and a half years later in 2001. Absolutely, absolutely. So he would have been moving in such circles that he would have been privy to advanced knowledge on that. And when it comes to what happened on 9-11, it's pretty clear to me that those events were planned decades in advance. We're probably talking the 1960s. And I'll get onto that as we progress as well. So just getting into some other interesting bits and pieces from the book, the early days of the industry. We're going back to the late 1950s all the way forward to present day. And we're looking at both sides of the Atlantic because there was a whole load of stuff that was unfolding both in the UK and in the US in the same time period. And there are some consistent overriding themes which I found crop up time and time again when you're looking at the backstory of the industry going through the decades. So they include, and I'll try and remember them all, paedophilia and child abuse, uh, dark occult secret societies, mm -hmm. Satanism, the ever-present influence of Aleister Crowley, the notorious dark occultist, and the various uh, secret societies that he was a part of and their teachings, a whole load of sirs, be very suspicious of anyone who's a sir, I would suggest, and a whole load of lords as well. The same goes for lords. When it comes to artists and those close to them, 
So managers, loved ones, partners, family members, we get a whole load of suicides and a whole load of overdoses. And we also get time and time again, family connections going back into military intelligence. So it might be the CIA, the FBI, MI5, MI6, the Pentagon, the Defense Department, the military, various arms of government. Time and time again, there are connections to prominent players in the music industry. And I feel a very valid question is, why should any of these elements be present in an industry that's supposed to be all about fun and entertainment? Because, you know, you mentioned the music industry to people, and most people will think, well, it's all about having fun, having a laugh, enjoying yourself, going out of the weekend, forgetting all your worries, you know, letting it all go and listening to some great music, which it should be. So why do we have all this stuff connected to it? So within the UK, another consistent element, unfortunately, is Jimmy Savile. And it turns out that he was very closely associated with many key players going back to the early days of the industry. So here he is with a very young Cliff Richard. And it may well be that in the days and weeks to come, I'll have more to say about Cliff Richard that I can add to this presentation. Uh, at the moment, it's kind of hanging in the air, but uh, there are lots of unanswered questions about the true nature of Cliff Richard, as I'm sure we're aware. And uh, one question I would have is, why was he so close to Jimmy Savile? And in this particular image, it appears as if Savile is hypnotizing him, because he's got a bloody pendulum there. And a concept that we're gonna visit quite a few times in the second half of this is the idea of the truth of a situation being placed right there in plain sight for those with the eyes to see. 99% of people seeing these images, these depictions, will not understand the relevance of what's being conveyed, so it'll go straight over their heads, but there's a small percentage that are learning to uh, understand when the truth is placed right in front of them and to see through the, the symbology that's being employed. So I wonder what's going on in this picture. So then here's Savile in rare dark haired mode with Paul McCartney, or is it? <laughs> I have a chapter in the book on Paul is dead, which is the very strong theory which seems to be gaining a lot of traction that the guy we think of in the world today as Paul McCartney is not the original James Paul McCartney and that the real Paul McCartney died in 1966 and was replaced by an imposter that's been taking his place ever since. There's a reason why my chapter on this in the book is the biggest chapter in there at 15,000 words. You cannot do this subject justice in a quick soundbite. And if you try to, and you say to people, did you know that Paul McCartney died in 1966 and the guy we have today is not really him? For anyone that's not looked into it, it sounds instantly ridiculous, impossible, and it will get thrown out by default action. So if you really want to get to the root of this issue and you really want to try and understand all the many facets to it, you've got to invest a bit of time and energy into doing the research. And as I say, that's why there's 15,000 words of it in the book, because it's a very, very deep subject area, and it goes way beyond what most people think. So I won't go into it any further today, because, again, we'll be here till 3 o'clock in the morning if I do. But anyway, here's Savile with uh, McCartney, and it's at the time of the release of the Sgt Pepper album. So it just shows that the Beatles had an association with Savile, and in actual fact, for a period... Reportedly, Savile acted as a kind of road manager for the Beatles, so he would drive them to their gigs in a van and unload their gear and stuff, so there was quite a close working relationship there. Then we also have the fact that Savile had a close relationship with the Rolling Stones, the other big group of the 60s, that were very much pitted as rivals to the Beatles. The Rolling Stones were the more edgy, dangerous, loutish kind of version of the clean-cut Beatles, at least as far as the images went. But uh, when you get down to the true nature of both groups, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they were both created, uh, and many researchers think that they both came out of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, and that they were put against each other to suggest a kind of rivalry, but mm -hmm. in actual fact, it was not left to chance or coincidence that both these groups would become the biggest names in the 1960s, mm -hmm. because nothing like that is left to chance it would all have been coordinated and directed and controlled, and these groups would have been elevated 
to those positions as part of a plan. So again, we have Savile associated with Mick Jagger here. And then it turns out that Savile even was associated with Elvis Presley, or at least met him. And who knew this? You know, I showed, I showed this slide in the US at the Free Your Mind conference last month, and there were gasps in the audience because people are just starting to hear about the antics of Savile over there. And they were shocked to realize that, you know, he met Elvis Presley. So it's all the key players of that time. Savile knew them all. And I'm sure we're familiar with Savile's backstory by now, how it ties into the royals. He was a close personal associate of Prince Charles. What's that all about? Uh, close personal associate of Margaret Thatcher. Moved in very elite circles. And seemingly there wasn't anyone of that day that wasn't tied into him in some way. And we're getting into the BBC and the true nature of the BBC. And this is a statue which sits outside Broadcasting House, the iconic uh, BBC building in London. It's from a Shakespeare play known as Ariel and Prospero, apparently. And those that are into Shakespeare and highbrow art and stuff look at this sort of thing and they'll uh, you know, explain to you what it expresses and what it represents and stuff. But I'm someone that kind of calls it as I see it and I call a spade a spade. And what I see here is uh, an adult male with a naked male child writhing against his crotch in ecstasy. So, you know, that's what this picture represents to me. So how fitting that it sits right outside the landmark building of the BBC, given what we've come to understand about the true nature of what's gone on there and many of the celebrities that's employed over the decades. We get into BBC Children in Need, this annual money grab where the public is implored to dig deep in their pockets and give money for these poor kids in needy situations around the UK. Well, it strikes me that there will be far fewer kids in needy situations in the UK and families associated with them if it hadn't been for the BBC and those that it's employed over the years, such as Jimmy Savile. So how uh, mocking is it that Savile was actually wheeled out as the public face of children in need for a number of years? And he's the one there on, on screen saying, come on, folks, you know, help these poor kids out. And then we have some interesting imagery, again, staying with the concept of the truth being placed right there in plain sight for those with the eyes to see, when we get the emblem for BBC Children in Need, which for many years has been Pudsey Bear. When you get into symbolism connected to satanic ritual abuse and trauma-based mind control, you'll see certain signs and symbols cropping up time and time again, which hint at the presence of this type of activity. If you go to a website known as Vigilant Citizen, vigilantcitizen.com, there's many articles and videos there where the writer breaks down uh, what these symbols actually pertain to. And one of the most common ones when it comes to childhood uh, trauma-based mind control and abuse is a teddy bear with mutilated or severed limbs. So that could be a missing arm, a missing le leg, or a missing eye in some cases. You also get it with dolls, where you get dolls with arms snapped off, legs snapped off. Also, you get broken mirrors, and you get things like unicorns and rainbows all associated with it. But ultimately, in each case, all this symbolism is hinting at the presence of a shattered childhood. The innocence of childhood has been corrupted, because when they take these children that they abuse, they take them at a very young age, they often come out of key bloodline families where they've been pretty much bred for this type of role. And this is what we get with a lot of celebrities. So you'll find it with a lot of musicians, with uh, Hollywood actors, TV stars, and other people in the public eye, even supermodels. They are abused at a very early age. And all these symbols kind of hint at the fact that their childhood has been robbed from them. So that's why you get things like teddy bears in situations like this. Also, with Pudsey Bear, we got the covering of one eye and the revealing of the other eye. And again, when we get into some of the symbology, which is connected to these networks, a lot of people call it the Illuminati, but you know, that's a catch-all term for some of these many secret societies, you find that the covering of one eye is deemed very important by way of a little calling card and a little motif. So that's what's going on with the Children in Need logo. And interestingly, it's also sitting inside a pyramid, or it was in this early version of it. So Savile's not the only known 
paedophile that was paraded as the public face of children in need. Here they are taking the piss once again with Gary Glitter. I've tried to find pictures of Jonathan King, but I can't find any of those, but I'm sure at one point he was wheeled out. Here's Rolf Harris with a big pudsy bear on stage. So, you know, it's all there for anyone that is able to uh, interpret what's going on. And as I say, of course, in most cases, people are not able to understand the truth of the situation that's being conveyed, but it is being absorbed by the collective subconscious of the general public, and, you know, this information is still being put out there. So getting back to some connections in the early days of the industry, Cliff Richard, again, was associated with this guy, a long-standing Tory peer by the name of Lord, so I told you there'd be a few lords. Uh, Boothby, this one, Very Bob good. Boothby. Uh, but Jana, yeah, peas in a pod, basically. And uh, if anyone's seen the recent movie on the craze called Legend, where Tom Hardy plays both craze, uh, Bob Boothby is portrayed in that movie in a not particularly flattering way. Uh, you know, bit of a bit of a freak. Then we get into the fact that Cliff Richard, Jimmy Savile, Many of the producers that were prominent in those early days of the industry, such as Joe Meek, Brian Epstein of the Beatles, a guy called Kit Lambert, and so many others, were all in an interconnected, synchronistic way tied in to the Cray Twins. And there are ties also going into Winston Churchill as well. It's uh, an amazing tapestry of uh, overlapping threads that just goes everywhere. And I go into further detail in the book. A lot of it came from an article that was put out by a former British intelligent operative by the name of T. Stokes. And it was picked up on later by a writer called Chris Spivey that you might be familiar with. And Spivey kind of embellished this article and put it out there on his website a few years ago. And it's absolutely fascinating in terms of showing how all these different characters and all these different elements are connected into each other. It brings in the Elm guest house, it brings in prominent politicians, all sorts of stuff. But as far as the Crays are concerned, I mean, the official story of who the Cray twins were was that there were these East End gangsters uh, that ran a criminal underworld in London in the 1960s. And it was all about, you know, prostitution and money laundering and gambling and all that sort of stuff. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the Crays were also involved in the procurement of children for paedophile rings among the rich and famous. So it would be Elm Guest House and all these other locations, Dolphin Square in Pimlico that we've heard about. The Crays, it would seem, were involved as part of their extracurricular activities in providing kids for these networks to be abused by, you know, elite paedophiles. And all their other criminal activities would appear to be a kind of smokescreen for what they were really up to. Interesting stuff given that they were twins as well, because there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the Crays may have been subject of mind control themselves, uh, trauma-based mind control. And when you get back to the very early experiments coming out of the MK Ultra program and its various spin-offs such as Monarch Programming, a lot of the early experiments coming out of the concentration camps in Nazi Germany at the end of the Second World War involved twins. And you had the infamous Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele who is known for experimenting on twins. And he would often try and see whether he could get the twins to dissociate from reality and uh, kind of take over each other's personalities. It's all deeply sick and dark stuff, but twins certainly seem to have been favored in many of these experiments. And so there are people that point to the mood swings that we saw with the craze. So one minute, as we saw in the movie with Tom Hardy, they would be very placid and urbane and you know polite and then at the drop of a hat, they could just instantly turn psychotic and uh, completely unpredictable. And this is all endemic of uh, dissociative identity disorder and multiple personality disorder that you get connected with trauma-based mind control. So it's another connection into that, and we see evidence of it throughout the entertainment industry. As I mentioned, another common element in all of this is Alistair Crowley and the various societies of which he was a part, such as the OTO and the Golden Dawn and the AA. And another question that people might like to ask themselves is, why is it that so many musicians through the ages have been absolutely infatuated with the works of Aleister Crowley? And they've encoded it into their lyrics and their music, and they've spoken about it in interviews. 
So here's Crowley on the sleeve to the Beatles' famous Sgt Pepper album. And he's lined up there along with all these other characters, most of them deceased at the time, who the Beatles cited as their heroes and their influences. And here's Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, who is another character who has been absolutely uh, fascinated with the works of Alistair Crowley. Here he is outside Boleskine House on the shores of Loch Ness in Scotland. And this is a house that was once owned by Crowley and he lived in it for a period from round about 1900. It's said to have been connected with all manner of rituals and seances which took place there. A lot of very dark occultic activity. And Crowley himself is said to have performed a ritual lasting several days and nights where he conjured up kind of demonic entities from other realms. And uh, he was unable to complete the ritual which would have involved sending him away again because he was called away urgently on business to France. And so because he left the ritual uncompleted, these entities kind of hung around the place for quite some time afterwards. Many of the owners of Boleskine House in the years and the decades that followed uh, actually committed suicide. And one of them was George Sanders, who was an actor. He played the saint in the 1940s. And he also was in one of the Pink Panther movies. He was one of the owners of Boleskine House. And uh, there's just lots of dark legends and uh, unsettling stories connected with this place. It's not the sort of place where I personally would want to spend a night. But it didn't seem to bother Jimmy Page, because in 1971, there was an opportunity for him to buy this house. And so he snapped it up and he owned it until 1991 and evidently spent some time living there. So rather him than me. Jimmy Page also bought himself an occult bookstore in Kensington in London, which he stocked with uh, old books from the likes of Crowley and you know, going back to many other secret societies and mystery school teachings and such. Such was his fascination with this whole world. And just recently, I think it was last year, Boleskine House just happened to burn to the ground. Not entirely sure what the circumstances were, but it went up in flames and there's not a whole lot left of it. So uh, a very interesting end to a place with a quite fascinating and chequered history. Other artists that have been fascinated with Crowley as well include David Bowie. Uh, he included a reference to the Golden Dawn and to Crowley in the song Quicksand. Also Elton John, uh, Daryl Hall and John Oates of all people. Daryl Hall has been very much into the works of Crowley and he's stated in interviews that he sees himself as a latter day Crowley kind of continuing his work. Uh, Jay-Z has been pictured with a sweatshirt with do what thou wilt on it, which is part of Crowley's famous motto, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. So throughout the generations and the decades, there have been artists that have expressed fascination with Crowley's works. As an interesting aside, uh, Crowley was also associated with Ian Fleming, the creator of the James Bond novels. And uh, Crowley worked for British intelligence for a time, seemingly alongside Ian Fleming, who worked for naval intelligence during World War II. So there's connections everywhere you look. Getting into a little section on the Rolling Stones, there's a lot more to say about the Beatles, and I've got a chapter in the book on the kind of esoteric and occult aspects of the Beatles. But the Rolling Stones are not to be outdone by them, because for everything you can find to say about the Beatles, there's a whole load more to say about the Rolling Stones in terms of aspects of their public persona and stuff that went on behind the scenes. One of their most famous songs is Sympathy for the Devil, which is uh, some interesting themes to get into. And one of their most famous albums was this one, which was called Their Satanic Majesty's Request. And the cover design for it is very reminiscent of Sgt Pepper from the Beatles. It's kind of an homage to it. So this album came out in December 67, whereas Sgt Pepper had been June 67. And there's all kinds of stuff going on. We've got Saturn up here, bearing in mind the reverence that these occult secret societies and networks show towards Saturn. There's a blood red depiction of Saturn there. And there's Mick Jagger with a wizard's hat with a crescent moon on it and all sorts of other stuff going on as well. When it comes to the Rolling Stones, a consistent factor through their career has been the presence of sudden death. And there was an element of this at a very notorious concert that they performed in December 1969 in Altamont in California, the Altamont racetrack. So at this concert, the Stones are performing on stage. 
they've just completed Sympathy for the Devil. And there's kind of rock music legend has it that they were performing Sympathy for the Devil while this event occurred. In actual fact, they'd moved on to the next song, but they'd just performed it. And what happened was this 18-year-old lad, you can't make it out too well on this image, but he's right here. This 18-year-old black guy by the name of Meredith Hunter was stabbed to death right in front of the stage as the group performed. Security for that day, or security, was supposed to have been handled by Hell's Angels. And there's a question, you know, what the hell were they doing in charge of security and not doing a very good job of it. And so this has led many commentators and researchers to question whether the stabbing of this guy was some kind of ritual sacrifice that was planned for and that the group would have been in the know as to it going on. Because there were many unsettling aspects to that day. There are people that were at the concert and there are fellow performers such as Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane who made comments about how there was this real dark air of foreboding over Altamont that day and it just seemed very menacing and unsettling. And there were astrologers that had commented on how the planetary conjunctions of that day made for some very dark influences and it was really not a great idea to be holding a rock concert on that day. So it's all kind of interesting elements which raise questions as to whether this was a planned for event. I'm just going to skip ahead one here. This is Brian Jones, who was the founding member of the Rolling Stones. He put the collective together before Mick Jagger and Keith Richards came on board. And Brian Jones became a very early member of what's known as the 27 Club. The 27 Club is the amazingly high number of musicians who just happen to have died at the age of 27 for one reason or another. So among their number, we also have uh, Robert Johnson, the blues musician. There's Ron Pigpen McKernan of The Grateful Dead, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, uh, Amy Winehouse, Kurt Cobain, Brian Jones, of course, and a whole bunch of others that I always forget. But you can look up the 27 Club on Wikipedia and it actually lists this high number of musicians that have died at this age. So Brian Jones was discovered dead floating face down in his swimming pool in his country house in Sussex on the 3rd of July 1969. And it was two years to the day before Jim Morrison was discovered dead, we're told, in a bathtub in his apartment in Paris on the 3rd of July 1971, exactly two years later. Jim Morrison died at 27, Brian Jones died at 27. This raises all kinds of interesting questions as to whether this could have been some kind of deliberate offing or some kind of ritual sacrifice in line with, uh, you know, these agendas that these controllers seem to stick to. Just an interesting little uh, tidbit regarding Brian Jones before we move on. He was involved in a drugs bust in, I think it was 1967, at the same time as Keith Richards and Mick Jagger got a visit from the police on exactly the same day. So Brian Jones in his Sussex house uh, got a drugs bust from the cops and he was found guilty of possession of uh, marijuana and the case went to court. And as he was leaving court, photographers caught a glimpse of the car that he left in. And the three numbers at the end of the registration plate on the car just happened to be 666. And this isn't the first or the last time that the number 666 crops up in this interesting backstory of the music industry. Another element of sudden death, just before we leave that concept related to the Rolling Stones, came in 2014 when Mick Jagger's girlfriend, who was an actress and model by the name of Loren Scott, was discovered dead in her um, apartment in Los Angeles at the age of 49. And we're told that she committed suicide. The night before she committed suicide, she held a dinner party for a whole bunch of friends who said she was in great spirits, uh, she was very wealthy, her career was going great, but for some reason, the next day, she just felt to uh, strangle herself with a silk scarf, we're told. So nobody really saw that one coming, least of all Mick Jagger, possibly. Brian Jones, his father, 
turns out to have worked for military intelligence. He was an aeronautics engineer. And the family relocated from Wales to Cheltenham, just up the road. And Cheltenham became the home of GCHQ, Government Communications Headquarters, all about spying and surveillance and phone tapping and very much the UK equivalent of the NSA in America. So this is the GCHQ building in Cheltenham. And when you get into some of the interesting imagery and symbology connected to Saturn, once again, you see quite a lot of it being deployed in the design of this building, which seems to have been designed very much in line with Saturnic influences. So uh, is it coincidence, coincidence that Brian Jones's family, bearing in mind the nature of his father's work, just happened to end up in Cheltenham? Interesting question. And it ties into other elements of prominent musicians and pop groups having family connections back into military intelligence, as I mentioned at the start. Here's an interesting one. I picked up on this story from the late Dave McGowan, who was an author and researcher who did a lot of great work, specifically into the groups that came out of Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles in the mid to late 60s. We're going to get on to a bit of that shortly. But he related this story in a podcast a couple of years ago, and it concerns a long-standing career CIA guy by the name of Miles Copeland. And Miles Copeland had three sons. This one, Miles Copeland Jr. They're not very imaginative with their, their names, these Americans. So this one was Miles Jr. And he started a record distribution company by the name of International Record Syndicate. So you can see the initials down here on his T-shirt, IRS. So then there was another brother by the name of Ian Copeland and he started a music management company, and the initials for it break down as FBI. And then the third son was Stuart Copeland of the police. So we have a situation where we have a CIA guy who has three sons, and they all become active in the music industry, and they start outfits known as the IRS, FBI, and the police. Are they taking the piss? So this is Dave McGowan, and unfortunately he passed away last year, 22nd of November, the anniversary of the Kennedy assassination uh, from cancer, we're told. And uh, this is his famous book, bringing together all his findings regarding the artists that came out of this neighbourhood of Los Angeles, up there in the Hollywood Hills, known as Laurel Canyon. We're talking the counterculture scene and what was known as the hippie era pretty much from 1965 onwards, going forward uh, to the tail end of the 1960s. The music in that period started to change. And there was this genre known as folk rock, which emerged out of Laurel Canyon. And there were a whole bunch of artists which, for whatever reason, just seemed to flock magnetically to this particular area. And McGowan has pointed out that prior to 1965, there was absolutely no music history to that area of Los Angeles at all. There were no clubs, there were no recording studios, no musicians were based there, but for some reason, from 1965 onwards, artists were flocking from all over the United States, they were coming from Canada, they were coming, in some cases, from the UK, and they were all being drawn to Laurel Canyon. And pretty much overnight, you had a whole industry there. All the prominent musicians of that scene were basing themselves in this small neighbourhood. So it goes from the Birds to the Eagles to the Mamas and the Papas, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, uh, the Beach Boys, uh, Buffalo Springfield, Captain Beefheart, uh, the Flying Burrito Brothers, Joni Mitchell, uh, and a whole bunch of others that I forget. But pretty much every prominent artist of that era were basing themselves out of Laurel Canyon. And McGowan uncovered the fact that there was a covert military research facility that just happened to be based in the middle of the neighborhood. And when he did a bit of further digging into the family backgrounds behind all these musicians that helped shape and mold that whole counterculture hippie scene, he discovered that in pretty much every case, with no exceptions, the fathers of these musicians were employed in some way by military intelligence. So again, it's the CIA, the Defense Department, the FBI, various police departments, various aspects of the government. And he put forward some pretty startling examples. 
The main one, which you may or may not have heard of, concerns Jim Morrison of The Doors. So Jim Morrison was always put out there as this iconic rock god. He was like the poster boy for the anti-war generation, anti-Vietnam War, counterculture, anti-establishment, articulating all the, the angst and the dissatisfaction that the youth had in that era with the establishment, with the older generation. That's pretty much the image that has gone down with Jim Morrison, and that's what he became an icon for. But here, he looks rather different. This is a young Jim Morrison pictured in January 1964, and he's on the bridge of a naval ship which is commanded by his father. So this guy on the right is Jim Morrison's father. And I'm sure you'd agree, Jim Morrison looks a little different there to the way he emerged a couple of years later coming out of Laurel Canyon. So this is Jim's dad, and his name was Admiral George Stephen Morrison. And he just happens to have been the naval commander in control of the fleet of ships that was involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which has since been exposed as a false flag. And it was the incident which springboarded the US into the Vietnam War. So as McGowan pointed out to me when I interviewed him a couple of years ago, you don't find a stranger juxtaposition between father and son than between those two particularly when you come to realise that this guy, who is a poster child for the anti-war counterculture scene, his dad basically started the Vietnam War. <laughs> How do you reconcile those elements? So that's the best example of an artist from this scene with ties going back into military intelligence. There are many others, as I say, in pretty much every case you can find connections going back in, including Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa's father was involved in chemical weapons research. He was a bioweapons engineer, and he worked out of the Edgewood Arsenal military base. And according to McGowan, Frank Zappa was actually born on that base. And Frank Zappa's wife, Gail Slopeman, attended naval kindergarten when she was five or six years old with a young Jim Morrison. And he points out that 20 years later, you know, he emerges out of Laurel Canyon as this larger-than-life rock god, and she emerges out of Laurel Canyon as the wife of another larger-than-life rock god. What are the chances of that happening by accident? So, again, we're seeing the evidence of a hidden hand directing events behind the scenes here. I should point out that with Frank Zappa, uh, I spent last weekend in the Netherlands at an event called the Open Mind Conference. And there were a whole bunch of speakers and researchers there. And one of them was Max Egan. I don't know if people are familiar with Max Egan, Australian guy. Great um, researcher, great speaker. And I spent a lot of time with Max and we were chatting over dinner. And he's a big Frank Zappa fan. Max is a musician himself. Zappa is his hero. And he's studied all his music. He's got all his albums. And he is not having it that Frank Zappa was a knowing kind of participant in what appears to be this exercise to mind control and socially engineer an entire generation, going from the fathers through to their sons. That certainly appears to be in the case with all the other artists, but Max pointed to many of the lyrics that Frank Zappa put in his songs and many of the statements that he made in interviews, which hint at him being a very consciously awakened individual and somebody that absolutely understood how the game is played, who's really controlling things in this world. And he wasn't happy about it and he didn't want to be a part of it. You know, he took every opportunity to warn people and advise people as to what was going on and as to the true nature of the establishment. So I'm certainly prepared to accept that that may have been the true nature of Frank Zappa and that he was caught up in this whole thing by nature of who his dad was, but he by no means went into this whole thing willingly. But the implication is that rather than something that evolved naturally and organically and was a grassroots movement coming out of California at that time, and it was young people just expressing themselves the way they spontaneously felt to. The whole scene, the whole hippie era, was manipulated and controlled and was an exercise in military intelligence. And it was being achieved through these families with the kids being put to use in prominent positions as musicians, also as Hollywood actors, to kind of mind control and steer 
the entire youthful generation of that time down a certain path, away from any kind of activism in anti-war uh, protests and such, or any other civil protests that were going on at the time, and uh, away from any other kind of activism, just towards this ethos that was around at the time of turn on, tune in, drop out. Because the music changing and becoming psychedelic, and by the way, we saw aspects of this happening in the UK exactly at the same time as it was playing out in California. So from sort of 1966 onwards, the music of British groups started to change. Most noticeably, the Beatles. You can divide the Beatles' career into two parts, pre-66 and post-66. So prior to 1966, the Beatles were making pleasant uh, pop songs that your auntie and your gran could sing along with. She loves you, I want to hold your hand, please please me. And then after 66, their music started to get very experimental and went off down a very different course. So you had things like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, Revolution Number no. 9, I Am the Walrus, and all these really tripped out, out there songs. You also had other groups like Pink Floyd coming onto the scene who were very psychedelic in their early days before their music changed. Even Status Quo were very psychedelic uh, when they first came out before they settled on their chosen sound. And so back over in the US, at the same time as all this music was changing, you had the arrival of LSD everywhere. And this guy, Dr. Timothy Leary, was largely responsible for the distribution of it. So he was a Harvard professor, and he came out presenting himself as this acid guru that was encouraging all these kids to trip out on acid and explore their consciousness and go on this amazing journey of discovery with all this groovy psychedelic rock music as the soundtrack to it all. Well, it turns out in later years that Timothy Leary was an asset of the CIA, and he admitted that in interviews himself. So rather than the public uh, persona that he portrayed, it would appear that he was sent into this scene as part of a mission by the CIA. There was another character around at that time by the name of Ken Kesey, and he was the author of the novel One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was later made into a movie with Jack Nicholson. Ken Kesey, uh, for a time, rode around California and other parts of the US in a psychedelic painted bus which puts me in mind of the bus that the kids went around in in Scooby-Doo. And it was known as Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters. So he had this troop of freaks that went around with him, and they were distributing free LSD to all the kids in all these areas. A pertinent question would be to ask where it all came from, given that it was quite expensive to produce, but Ken Kesey seemed to have an endless supply of it. And it turns out that Kesey himself, as well as almost certainly being a victim of trauma-based mind control and coming out of the whole MK Ultra scene, was also an asset for the CIA and worked for them as well. So we have another link going back into that organisation as well. It seems to me that in the mid to late 1960s, the powers that be were absolutely doing a number on the generation that's come to be known as the baby boomers. So this is the generation that was born straight after the Second World War, mid to late 40s. They were coming of age in the mid to late 60s. And this generation, it seems to me, was very much in the crosshairs of those that were controlling and directing these events. Because there were a lot of very traumatic things that were foisted on the American public in this time. So as well as the arrival of acid and all this psychedelic rock music changing, you also had the Manson family murders in 1969, which was a very traumatic event for the US. It occurred a week or so, I think, before the famous Woodstock concert in August 69. The Manson family, Charles Manson in particular, were connected back into this organisation known as the Process Church of the Final Judgment. And this was a kind of dark occult uh, group or cult. And uh, it was also associated with David Berkowitz, who was the son of Sam, serial killer, emerging later in New York. Also connected into the Process Church was Sirhan Sirhan, who was the guy that is said to have shot Robert Kennedy in 1968. So they're all connected back into the Process Church. And another character connected into it was Bobby Beausoleil, one of Manson's disciples. Bobby Beausoleil was recruited to record the soundtrack to a movie called Lucifer Rising, 
And this came from a filmmaker by the name of Kenneth Anger, who's still around today, he's in his 80s. But his speciality back then was making very short films consisting of striking montages of images that were very occultic, satanic, and homoerotic in nature. So his two most famous short films were Lucifer Rising and Invocation of My Demon Brother. In both cases, the Rolling Stones were involved, particularly Mick Jagger, who produced the soundtrack for Demon Brother on a Moog synthesizer. And one of the soundtracks for Lucifer Rising was originally produced by Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, who was closely associated with the Rolling Stones. So again, we have connections and overlapping elements everywhere. Kenneth Anger, Jimmy Page, the Rolling Stones, David Berkowitz, the uh, Process Church, Charles Manson. Anger eventually threw out Jimmy Page's soundtrack for Lucifer Rising in favour of a soundtrack which was composed by Bobby Beausoleil. But at the time, Bobby Beausoleil was serving a life sentence in prison for the murder of a music teacher called Gary Hinman and he composed the soundtrack to Lucifer Rising from his jail cell. So then we have further connections from the Process Church of the Final Judgment operating out of San Francisco into this organisation, the Church of Satan, founded in 1966 by its high priest Anton LaVey. And there were a whole bunch of celebrities in the 1960s that were tied into the Church of Satan, including Sammy Davis Jr and the actress Jane Mansfield. And in latter years, you've had Marilyn Manson, who's been ordained as a priest of the Church of Satan, perhaps not too much of a surprise. Uh, and Mark Olmond of Soft Cell is uh, also connected to the Church of Satan. Who knew that? So there was lots of stuff going on in 1966, and it strikes me that there was something important about that year when you get into numerology and you get into symbology. So in 66, we had the foundation of the Church of Satan. Uh, we get into the whole thing with the Beatles and the Paul McCartney replacement theory. As I say, I'm not going to get into it big time this evening, but this event is said to have taken place in 1966, and most research researchers have settled on the date of the 11th of September, 66. So anyone that wants to delve into that head first, there's a great book by a guy called Nick Collistrom, and he's written a book called The Life and Death of Paul McCartney, 1942 to 1966. I was with him in Amsterdam at the weekend as well, having a good chat with him about it. Great book. Can you spell his surname? Collistrom, K-O-L-L-E-R-S-T-R-O-M. Okay. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, so Collistrom has, has demonstrated some fascinating evidence to suggest that the guy we think of today as Paul McCartney is not the original guy. <laughs> I'll just leave you with these two pictures and I'll leave you to reflect on whether you are looking at two pictures of the same individual or whether you're looking at two different people. 1966, well in 1968, a couple of years later, there was an amazing movie which came from Roman Polanski, Satanist and paedophile, but don't let that worry you, uh, called Rosemary's Baby. And I would suggest that the narrative of Rosemary's Baby, which is all about satanic cults, and how Satanists hide in plain sight in society. And often people that have very respectable public veneers are actually involved in satanic ritual activity behind the scenes. I would suggest that Rosemary's Baby is telling you what really goes on, particularly with connections to the entertainment industry, far from a work of fiction. Roman Polanski would definitely have been in a position to know. His wife was Sharon Tate, who was one of the victims of the Manson murders in, in August 69. Right. So uh, an interesting image here, which promoted the movie Rosemary's Baby, which absolutely hints at trauma-based mind control when you get into some of the symbology employed there. Here's another one from Rosemary's Baby, the covering of one eye, which becomes very interesting. And Rosemary's Baby was set in the Dakota building, this very gothic uh, building in New York, up there near Central Park, outside which John Lennon was assassinated in December 1980. It's the same building. Lots of synchronistic links between the Beatles and Rosemary's Baby, Mia Farrow, Roman Polanski, when you really get into the synchro mysticism of it. Rosemary's Baby, although it was released in 1968, in the narrative of the, of the movie, it's made clear that it's set in 1966, because one of the characters points to a calendar of 1966, and he says it's year one. So something about 66 was deemed important. So. Uh, this whole period of the mid to late 60s is absolutely fascinating to study because of all these 
social changes that were going on and all these kind of uh, uh, esoteric aspects yeah. to the time as well. And there was so much pinned on that latter part of the decade and particularly focusing on 66, as we've said. So in 1966, production was underway on this movie, absolutely mind-blowing, a masterpiece, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey, released in 68, like Rosemary's Baby. But um, it was a futuristic sci-fi epic, of course, and it tied in with LSD being foisted on the hippie scene because there are stories of uh, kids at the time who would be getting high on acid and then going into the movie theatre to watch this film and to absolutely blow their heads off with uh, all the symbology that was in it. It's an amazing film to watch when you're straight, so yeah. what, what, what happens to you when you're on acid, I can't imagine. <laughs> but uh, there was some reason why Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke chose to look forward 35 years to 2001 in which to base this film. You might expect that they would have chosen 2000 being the start of a new millennium, but for some reason there was something about 2001 that was deemed important. So uh, did anything happen in 2001 of, of any note? Well, in actual fact, the start of the millennium, the real start, is 2001. So, it, so it's said, yeah. So um, we, of course, had this, the events of September 11th. And going back again to 66, Production, uh, construction on the South Tower of the World Trade Center was underway in 1966. And then 35 years later, we get the events of September 11th, which we're all familiar with. And probably most people know by now that there were many, many depictions of what was going to happen on 9-11-2001 in the years and the decades leading up to that date in movies, TV shows, cartoons, record sleeves, stage shows, and the like. Hundreds and hundreds of examples of this have been cited. Here's just a few of them. All of these happened in the 1980s or the 1990s, a long while before 2001. And of course, the obvious implication is that those parties that directed the events of 9-11 and caused it to happen were in league with those parties that produced, ultimately, these movies, videos, TV shows, etc. How else to explain how hundreds of depictions of what was going to come to pass could be encoded into these works of popular culture? If, again, if we're talking of odds, we're probably into billions upon billions upon billions upon billions to one that this could happen by coincidence. Of course, it hints at foreknowledge. Well, and, <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Many aspects of it in Back to the Future, for sure. Yeah, really. So uh, predictive programming, the whole concept of it is all about placing the truth of what's going to happen in plain sight to give the general public an opportunity to know. They do it in encoded cryptic form so that most people couldn't be expected to understand what it is, but nevertheless it's there. Then we get into some more signs and symbols that we've seen commonly put out there by popular music artists through the years. And there are lots of them that crop up time and time again. So we have this one, a young Michael Jackson with this particular hand sign. Here's Beyonce from a couple of years ago doing the same thing. Here's a whole bunch of uh, characters you may recognize. They just happen to be throwing up the same sign. And what we're told about it is that this sign is supposed to mean, okay, cool, everything's okay. And when you see people doing it, that's all they're saying. But when you get into satanic secret societies and the world of the dark occult, it becomes a method of communication. And it's another depiction of this number which is deemed so important to those that are you know, controlling these institutions. It is 666. It's very much connected with Saturn. So uh, Saturn is the sixth planet. Saturday is the sixth day of the week on which Saturn is uh, revered. You have the hexagonal pattern at the North Pole of Saturn, six-sided. Uh, which is also a reflection of the six, and 666 ties very much into that. It's the number of the beast in the book of Revelation as well, of course. And for all these reasons, it's considered very important by these dark occult priest classes. This is Beats by Dre, the headphone range, which when you get the advertising literature, it appears to be a B for beats, but actually it's just another, another depiction of six, 666, and Dr. Dre would be one to know. Here's an ad for an album by Drake, where you get the six and an all-seeing eye, so you get two symbols for the price of one. Here's another popular one that you see uh, time and time again. Here's a few world leaders slash manipulated stooges uh, giving it this one. And this one has 
a public cover story as well. In deaf sign language, when the thumb is extended like this, it's supposed to mean I love you. So you have an I, an L and a U. And of course, Hillary and Bush and Obama and Cheney are just the people to say I love you, aren't they? Because they, they care like that. Well, it is. Uh, there's another depiction of it. When you uh, tuck the thumb in, it starts to take on a, a different meaning. It's known as the horned hand or the devil horns. And it's another method of communication or calling card of Satanists and dark occultists. So here's Eminem giving you its uh, true usage. And here's something that it alludes to, which is this androgynous entity known as Baphomet, very much beloved by Satanists and uh, mystery schools and dark occult uh, practitioners. So the horned hands are considered by many researchers to be a depiction of Baphomet and it's those that are controlled by the industry letting you know what they're a part of and their true nature. Again, it's putting the truth in plain sight. Jay-Z has been very fond of this symbol, this triangular pyramidical thing in recent years. He calls it the rock sign. It's supposed to represent the diamond. But it turns out to be something a bit different. There's Kanye West doing the same thing. And here's Anton LaVey of the Church of Satan. And it turns out that he was doing this back in the 1960s. But it goes back much further than that into the ancient world. It's part of the Indian mudra system of sign language. And it's had many other uses as well. It's commonly known as a triangle of manifestation. And the idea is that when you imbue this symbol with your will and your intent, you can help to physically manifest something that you uh, are willing into place. So in the hands of an occult practitioner, it can be very powerful in bringing a certain situation around if you know what you're doing. And then the other one that we see all the time is the covering of one eye, as I mentioned. Here's pretty much every celebrity of the present day that you can imagine who just happened to be doing it. Yes, that's right. And there are sceptics that will say they're just doing it to be cool. It's just a way to look fashionable. Really? So every single name that's up there that is a household name, that is a celebrity, just feels the spontaneous need to look cool in this way. They couldn't have found another way to do it. You know, Some people will, will always be sceptical of this stuff, no matter how much evidence you place right in front of them. And I guess there's nothing you can do about that if that's the route they choose to go down. But I know what I see. And I know that to me, this is another method of communication. It's telling you something and it goes beyond uh, coincidence. And the all seeing eye isn't anything to do with the, the evil eye that they have in sort of Turkish culture? Uh, there are many depictions of it. Uh, depending on which researcher you speak to, they place different kind of meanings on it. But uh, yes, yeah, the all seeing eye that came out of Egyptian uh, culture and Freemasonry and it probably has other depictions as well. So I'm going to skip quickly through this bit because we're short on time, but this is the logo for MI5, British Intelligence, which is a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, and the top of the uh, pyramid there is cut off with a capstone, and you see another depiction of an eye there. And then the corners of the pyramid are cut off down there. And OK, this slide is usually missing, so I'm glad it's there. Paul Van Dyke is uh, a very prominent electronic dance music producer and DJ and for some years he's been using this logo and I've tried to figure out what it is it's quite enigmatic and it turns out that when you flip it upside down and you place it side by side it becomes very similar to the logo for MI5 British Intelligence and he's not the only one to have used it there's a Japanese dance music producer called Steve Aoki who uses a logo that's almost exactly the same right yeah, it's like that as well. certainly got Masonic overtones, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to skip through these last bits. And we come back full circle to our old pal Savile. And we get into the reasons why I believe all this stuff is being done. Why these signs and symbols are everywhere. Why they announce to us what they're all about and what they plan to do in advance. Savile came out on a TV chat show few years ago, wearing a sweatshirt saying, I am an animal and I will eat you if I have to. And the host of the show says, what does this mean, Jimmy? What's all this? And he says, oh, you must give them all fair warning, you see. So Savile would have been one to know how this whole dynamic operates. And it's tied in with 
free will consciousness with which we as humans uh, are imbued and it's our greatest gift, the ability to make choices for ourselves based on our consciousness and to reap the appropriate karmic consequences based on the decisions that we take. It also ties into consent and it ties into natural law. Natural law is known by many different names. Some people refer to it as spiritual law, universal law, consequentialism, the law of cause and effect. Whatever name you put on it, the concept is always the same. And it can be summed up very simply with this phrase, do no harm, but take no shit. You know, you can expand on it, but the basic core of this code of morality, which is set into place by the creative force behind the universe, is that we are supposed to do no harm. Do not treat others in a way you would not wish to be treated yourself. We have free will and we can choose to align ourselves with this truth and live according to it and put our thoughts, emotions and actions in line with it. Or we can choose to go another way and disregard it. This law is in effect eternally and everywhere, universally, whether we like it or not, or whether we choose to accept it or not, it still governs aspects of our lives. And it dishes out karmic consequence in accordance with the choices we make. It's my belief that the control system that we have understand that this dynamic is in effect in the universe. They understand that they're governed by it. They hate it, but they grudgingly accept it. They feel that by doing things like predictive programming, by throwing up symbols to let us know what they're really a part of and the true nature of their satanic occultic activities, they're giving us the opportunity to know and to understand. They of course do it in encoded cryptic form so that unless you're literate in symbols, you will not understand what's being conveyed. It will get absorbed by the subconscious mind of the collective general public. It won't get into the conscious mind where it can be properly analyzed and understood. But nevertheless, they feel that by doing that, they've got our implied consent or tacit approval for what they plan to do. When we don't object to it and say, we're not having this, you can't do it, they take that as a green light to go right ahead because we've given our consent. To not say no is to say yes in their sick, twisted mentality. I would suggest that they've got it very twisted because we are talking about mentally ill psychopaths here who aren't very well. Uh, so it's understandable that they would have a twisted, distorted perception of how things work. But it is my belief and the belief of many other researchers in this field that they're observing this tenet of do no harm. So they feel that by telling us, by getting our unspoken consent, they've done no harm. And now the karma has been shifted to us because we've said we're okay with it. Undue influence and consent is what's really going on. And we get into how we overcome this then. You know, having understood the nature of what's been rolled out through the entertainment industry over the decades and what ties into every other aspect of human society and what has been governing life on Earth for a very long time. The way out of it has to lie in consciousness. And Alistair Crowley stated in his book of magic that magic with a K is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. This is a dynamic that the dark occult priest class that have been holding humanity in their grip for so long understand and they put to practice. People often ask, how is it that what can only be a few tens of thousands of individuals have been controlling and manipulating the lives of the other seven billion people on the planet for so long. How is it possible they can gain that level of control? They've done it through understanding the true nature of reality and through applying their will and their intent in accordance with it. They understand how this works and they understand that if you direct your consciousness and your will into a desired situation enough and if there is a certain number of you all on the same page all in alignment bringing your thoughts emotions and actions together then you can actually affect things which physically manifest and play out 
And if you have a dark occult priest class in possession of this knowledge, keeping the rest of the human population in ignorance of it, then they can gain a major tactical advantage over everyone else. So the only way to overcome this is for large numbers of people to understand how all this works and to come together in their consciousness and to imagine and to will a better situation into existence for all of us in line with natural law, with the do no harm dynamic. Because if everyone in the world were observing this simple rule, the golden rule, do no harm, then everyone would be considering whether an action they're about to undertake is going to impact negatively on someone else. And if it is, they don't undertake that action on the grounds that you wouldn't want it done to you. When you think about it, if everyone understood this golden rule, and if it was getting taught in schools, and it speaks volumes that it's not, then everyone in the world would have a better deal because everyone would be living in accordance with that truth. So imagine what would happen if large numbers of people in understanding of how this all works came together and pulled their consciousness in a positive way and focused on overwriting this version of reality that we currently have and have had for a very long time. You know, uh, imagine and will a situation based on positivity and based on the higher vibrations rooted in love frequencies as opposed to the, the dense, low, fear-based stuff that we've been living in for so long. We hear from so many scholars in this area that uh, emotions and consciousness rooted in the higher frequencies of love are so many times more powerful than the dark, fear-based stuff and can overwrite it a thousand times over. If only enough of the general population would come together and understand this. So it seems to me that the only way that we can undo the situation that we have is in higher consciousness and getting people to understand how all this works. There's a great phrase that I always finish with because I love this. If not now, then when? If not you, then who? So I'm ending each talk by pointing out that any one individual can be a part of the process that needs to take place for us to break the mind control and the spiritual enslavement that we're under. You don't need letters after your name. You don't need to have attended any prestigious university. You don't need to come from any particular walk of life. Any one individual with free will consciousness intact can be a participant in the process. And if not now, then when? Well, uh, tonight at 10 o'clock or tomorrow morning over breakfast, is as good as in 10 years or 100 years. You know, the process can occur any time enough of us want it, and anyone can be a part of the process that needs to occur to turn things around. I'm just about finished on time. Uh, as I say, this has just pretty much skimmed the surface of what's in the book. There's 20 chapters. I get into a whole world of things such as trauma-based mind control, transhumanism, how that whole thing is playing out, the systematic degeneration of hip-hop culture and black culture. I'm going into that. And uh, there are two chapters at the end focusing on where the solutions lie. And again, that's all about free will consciousness, consent and natural law. So uh, I've got copies of the book available for anyone that wants to purchase one tonight. If you don't want to get one tonight, it's available on Amazon. You can look it up on there. Or if you want a signed copy from me personally, you can email me and we can make that happen. Uh, I think I'm hanging around for a while in the cafe upstairs. If anyone wants to speak to me, £25 for the book. If anyone wants to speak to me or got any questions, I'll be hanging around for a while. But uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to put across and I'm pretty much on time, so thank you for listening.